the shakuhachi and its subtlety, the way that it deals with vibration and that feedback loop you, you were describing, it's very subtle in terms of the vibration compared to a reed vibrating in your head or your lips vibrating or even the, even compared to the vocal cords. It's a very kind of soft, velvety texture. And um, so that lends itself really well to sort of just staying with that sound and having this kind of expanded inner um, experience that is, I mean, I'm saying mind, body, spirit as kind of one phrase, but it probably goes way beyond that. You know, consciousness, awareness, vibration, manifestation, the invisible. Welcome back to the Sounds of Sand podcast presented by science and non-duality. My name is Michael O'Reilly. Today I'm in conversation with Cornelius Boots. And Cornelius is a wood-winding pioneer composer, root philosopher, nano-theist, and elemental nature lover. And Cornelius performed on Shakuhachi flute back at a science and non-duality conference several years ago, and we're excited to reconnect with him and go deeper into his work. And we'll listen to some of his music in between uh, our conversation, and there'll be a full-length piece of music to close out today's episode. Today was a fascinating conversation, and we'll discuss his path with the shakuhachi flute and some of its cultural and spiritual significance, especially in the context of Zen Buddhism and Taoism, as well as Rosicrucian alchemy and how this applies to Cornelius's expansive worldview of music, sound, breath, and vibration. All today on the Sounds of Sand podcast presented by Science and Non-Duality. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. All right, so I'm here with Cornelius Boots. Cornelius, thanks for being on the Sounds of Sand podcast. Hey, this is already fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so to kind of orient the listeners, I was uh, wondering if I could ask you about kind of your your path and your how you got into shakuhachi flute playing and, yeah, just just what led you here today. <laughs> Yeah, it's a long, uh, it's a long journey, we could say. But the the short version is kind of like, um, I started the clarinet in fourth grade, and there was uh, a kind of a awareness spike that happened really, really, really early that had to do with the um, the sense of the vibration of the reed in the tone production, like in my head. And so at that kind of young age, so that's the best way to describe it. Um, it was a kind of a, yeah, like a, an, an illumination moment. I could say reverse engineering in terms of like, oh, that, that's, that's cool. Or doesn't that feel cool to play? It wasn't just this. It wasn't just the sound. Um, you know, my, my parents aren't musicians, but they're fans. And so we grew up with a lot of music, you know, good uh, range of, music up until that point up until the early 80s and um so i knew the clarinet sounded good already that's why i picked it but the sense perception the vibration in the head <laughs> teeth um and the 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 reed itself the wood element was um really appealing and then it's just a it was just a really engaging um, embodiment practice. None of this I really realized at the time. I just was like into it and pursuing it. But reverse engineering it, it's kind of like I'm just still doing that, you know. And, and Shakuhachi came along just through a recording and then through a series of, you know, networks where I was able to find a teacher, um, highly qualified teacher who didn't live too far from where I was 
in Chicago at the time, 2001. So I had already finished music school was like a pretty, you know, basically overly trained, uh, underpaid professional woodwinder in Chicago, focusing on my rock band. And, um, had, had, you know, already been through playing a lot of jazz, big band jazz, small group, experimental music, classical, I've been in a professional orchestra on bass clarinet. Um, and, and at some point started composing in the middle of all that. But Shankahachi wasn't immediately clear how it related to all that at the time. I just kind of liked it. And it's not something that you think of doing as a as a deeply trained musician we don't tend to have the approach well that's not totally true some people do they just get a to be like no i'm gonna play upright bass you know because they found one in a pawn mm-hmm. shop and then they just start playing that so i had plenty of instruments already all the all the clarinets all the saxophones and a couple of flutes as a doubler as we call it in jazz so it's not like i was looking for to add something or you know but there was a sense of shakuhachi offering these other qualities that um i guess we we could say were just latent in the the woodwinds that we're familiar with they're at the root of it but they're not they're not what got fed uh to to generate what they became if, if that makes sense you know the bass clarinet was my focus for many years but it its design was for marching band Right. Yep. Whereas Shakuhachi clearly had a, a, an intention behind it that was more, hmm. not just implicitly, but overtly from Zen Buddhism, which I had been interested in and in reading uh, bits and pieces here and there. And the first great book I happened to randomly get on Zen was really about, a, 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 I call it a high mode compare contrast between the basics of the Buddha's teaching and the basics of Jesus Christ's teachings. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of pluralism or, um, yeah, the same approach that we had with style mixing in music was also evident that you could, you could think that way when it came to spiritual and religious teachings or traditions or practices and, um, so the shakuhachi was called Zen shakuhachi flute on the recording. I first heard it on, so I thought, "Oh wow, this mm. this goes with it in some way." And uh, yeah, just wanted to check it out, and that was twenty two years ago. And so, when you're describing the uh, maybe to paraphrase the essentialness of of the shakuhachi, how it's 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 uh, well, actually, to describe for listeners, so we'll, we'll be playing some of your music throughout the episode. Um, but can you describe the shakuhachi for maybe for people that haven't seen it? Yeah. So it is like, technically we would say it's a vertically held end blown flute. So essentially that just means it's a tube that you hold vertically and you put up to your face and, um, you have to form a proper embouchure. So this is the key piece that's kind of missing in the, the lay people's knowledge, mm-hmm. how flutes actually work. Even if you look up incredible uh, images of Krishna playing the flute. A lot of them will be like, yeah, you don't, you don't play a flute like that. You know, just put your mouth over, over part of it and then blow into it. Like it's a whistle. Um, so embouchure based woodwinds um, require a lot more on the part of the player to, to, for tone production. So Shakuhachi is like really far to the side of, um, uh, not being a push button instrument, let's just say, um, you have to do, you have to really, uh, adapt to it. So sometimes I just describe it as if you, if people know what a clarinet is, if you take the mouthpiece off the clarinet, take all the keys off the clarinet and plug up all the holes, except for five finger holes, Mm -hmm. that's what we're dealing with. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that different than that apart from, you know, maybe sanding down the, uh, the, where, where it goes on your chin in order to, to make it le- a little less of a sharp edge. Right. Um, it's different wood for, though, right? Well, these, yeah. And that's the other key feature is that this is, this is bamboo and it's root end bamboo, which is a, a development that it's a little mysterious 
when that started happening, but it's a very cool aspect um, in terms of the, the lower end, what would be the bell of the clarinet uh, is, is the shaved roots uh, that had been in the ground. So it's, it's pretty fun to both just sort of stare at that and be in amazement at that physical part, you know, nature constructed aspect. And then also there's something energetic about spending all this time putting your vital chi breath flow into it and then having it feed back into your head and body from, mm -hmm. from a root end rather than just, just the top part of the tube of mm -hmm. bamboo. So yeah, the bamboo aspect for me is a big um, aspect um, to the to the extent that I'm in a uh, a subcategory of shakuhachi player where I play what's called jinashi, which means without g, which is a paste or lacquer that's put in the bore for in a variety of amounts for either weatherproofing or actual tuning. And so if, if you harvest a bamboo and you need to make a flute and it's not working so well, um, you could basically rebuild the bore with this uh, G paste. Um, but then for me personally, and a lot of other people, like my students, for instance, it, it kind of gets in the way of the breath coming back directly from the bamboo fiber surface. Mm. And so as, as um, granular as that seems, uh, like I said, there's you spend a lot of time doing this in in, in practice, and uh, you get to really know what's what you're working with. And I don't like uh, stuff being in the way between me and the and bamboo. One thing I love about the shakuhachi is the there's uh, a lot of percussive sounds that I think come from the technique, and a lot of uh, I don't know. I'd say like maybe a, a density of the texture of the sound. It doesn't sound very pure. There's, it's a very woody sound. Is it connected with a didgeridoo at all? Like, it, what, what is the overlap there? Maybe in, in the history. Yeah, I mean that's a, a somewhat of a common question. Essentially, since especially since we hold it uh, vertically and the design. So, so on the one hand, on a design level, they're like very similar almost. But then on a sort of tone production and performing level, they're, they're complete opposites. Like you couldn't get more opposite if you look at from a certain parameter. Mm -hmm. um, because for one thing, the, the dig uh, has no finger holes, right? So it's a, it's a single fundamental based tube. Whereas our tube has a couple, not many, not as many as normal, you know, or more standard flutes. Yeah, normal is not something I normally say. But uh, yeah, so more common, let's say, flutes are going to have six or seven finger holes to get your diatonic scales. We have five finger holes and, and one is redundant. So only four pitch changing finger holes. So that means, okay, where are the other eight notes of the chromatic scale going to come from? But that's a sort of a separate question. It's already got finger holes. So it's designed essentially to do melodic stuff as well as you could do drones. Mm -hmm. um, shock, uh, uh, once you start circular breathing, which is something I do, it's also not super common on shakuhachi, but all woodwinders uh, need to basically revitalize that practice. This is a part of my uh, mission mm -hmm. <laughs> these days. And so that would, would, would relate it back to the, the, the why and the how of didgeridoo, because you have to circular breathe, and you're just going to, you're just going to out one little sound. So circular breathing and a constancy of tone and this elemental quality to the tone, that's also something I feel like we have in common. Uh, but the tone production method is, uh, it shares with brass instruments. It's a mm -hmm. lip buzz tone production, yeah. um, which is very different than generating um, an airstream that is specifically aligned with the, the edge of the tube, which is mm -hmm. what flute fluting is nice. so the tone productions are vastly different mm -hmm. and then how on didgeridoo you're going to be layering vertically it doesn't just play the fundamental but you're, you're you're basing the fundamental and then pulling harmonics above that so you have a basically a polyphony inside the tube happening mm -hmm. um which we could do a little bit of that with harmonics but it's a little more like other instruments in the sense that you're changing pitches and 
doing something that's um, melody based, not drone based. And could you uh, just quickly um, describe circular breathing for people that might not be familiar with that term? Yeah. So sometimes I had been saying this is more properly called a constant exhale or something like this or um, perpetual exhale, we could say. And so because of the way the um, respiratory tract in the head, in, in the nose and the mouth is designed, it's, it's actually no big deal at all. So I was told about this. I didn't think it was possible, even though I was already listening to players that used it like Ross on rolling Kirk. Um, it's no big deal to continue, uh, to exhale, um, as a, in a brief, um, kind of way. That's not a true exhale as you breathe in through the nose. In other words, exhale is how we produce our sound. And if you have, you know, note number one and then breathe in note number two, that's called phrasing. And, and so that's become the way that all wind instruments are perceived as their primary modality phrased breathing and so they, is, you, you inhale quickly before you do that next well, i'm phase. describing this i'm describing the the, the standard yeah approach that, that, that neglects circular breathing first mm -hmm. so which is phrased breathing meaning you just like a singer mm -hmm. so a lot of melodic understanding is based on either birds or singers and they're they're using their breath uh to to, to, to create the melody and then breathing in before the next part of it with circular breathing, you can connect those two exhales with a little puff as you breathe in through the nose. So you don't need to have a break in the sound production. If that, so, so your, your mm -hmm. exhale and then a little, it's kind of a staple or a suture. I sometimes describe it. There's like a false exhale as you breathe in at the same time. So if we were to see the air particles, uh, they would be going out of the mouth cavity into the instrument as the same time as air is coming in through the nostrils all the way down to the lungs and ideally down to the, to the diaphragm or the abdomen, because that's where you're going to want to support your tone. So it's a real, it, it opens up a whole new universe of your, connection to your instrument. And this is really the primary core of my approach and, and my approach for teaching is my definition of practicing is you set aside time to deepen your connection to the flute hmm. or to the instrument, fill in the blank or to the bamboo. If you're, if you're like, like me interested that that's what it's made of also. Um, and this circular breathing aspect has a real, um, yeah, it just opens up a whole new vista mm -hmm. of embodied sound producing connectivity. And then on a musical level, it opens up the, the possibility of doing other things that I do quite a bit of drones and bass lines and patterns mm -hmm. um, that are not in the mind of the melodic player. Um, and the reason I get a little evangelical about it so to speak, is because I can hear the limitations of players around me. I can hear their breathing isn't quite as full and deep as it, it could be. They don't their their tone, their ability to create their their own sound with their connection to their instrument is slightly limited in many cases by the fact that this practice has been reduced in the in the com in the mainstream of wind instruments. Whereas I speculate it was done at least 50% of the time in the early days of woodwinding, which were 20, 30,000 years ago. <laughs> um, and so that links us back to this, the, the idea that with didgeridoo, we can, we can uh, get a little bit more validation that that, that that is something that's embedded in that practice, which is also very old.
I think it would be interesting to get into some of the philosophy behind the music you create. I've been reading a lot on your website, and you have a beautiful website with a lot of articles and and um, writings about the the spiritual and metaphysical reality behind the music. Um, I just wanted to read a quote from your website, and maybe you could uh, um, expand on it a bit more. So um, it says, "This is an awareness based experiential process." It is also an animistic approach to instruments. Two main roots of the practice are absolute tone and tension alchemy. Rhythm and air lead all else, and by combining intention with awareness, all is possible. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time since I (laughs) conjured that uh, verbiage. Yeah. It's interesting because tension is used and then intention is used. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, which is a little confusing to me now <laughs> hearing it. I might want to edit that, but it, it does synopsis. I mean, all that can take, you know, months or years to unpack yep. with, uh, with, with uh, personal practice, but it does, it does set the bar in a different place than where, um, as I say, mainstream uh, training for wind instruments sits right now, you know, right now, you you basically work on your tone in order to have an on switch to play a bunch of repertoire. Mm-hmm. So your tone is in service to the structures or context of that repertoire, whether it be the marching band or the symphony orchestra, the opera pit orchestra, the um, the uh, you know jazz rhythm section or horn playing, um, etc. Whereas this practice involves all of these, this more holistic um, body, mind, spirit. So I think that, that that what you read there is is like an attempt to begin to unpack the way in which it's a body, mind, spirit practice. Um, meaning it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change you mm-hmm. a, as you work with it, which is a common misunderstanding that, you know, anyone that shows up to do lessons that wants to add it to themselves, but still be the same person. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. It ends up not working out. However, it is a gradual change, you know, I mean, compared to some of these other um, techniques and practices and consciousness expanding things, you know, a lot of things that were touched on really um, intelligently and deeply in the 2015 sand conference that I went to, you know, there's a lot of things for people to, to select, to engage for their own uh, evolution and transformation or, or healing or just, just expansion, you know, understanding that we're not really being told a lot of what's been possible, um, for the human mind, uh, body and spirit. And so instrumental study is, is kind of like that too. It's viewed as a kind of a, um, well, I don't, I don't want to say what it might be viewed as, but what it could be is like what you just what you just read there you know if you're ready to really be there when um you have these revelations of whether it be tone production or enjoying a song you're playing or enjoying playing with other people improvisation learning a piece that you like i mean there's a lot of um rewards i think the main thing with shakuhachi is it if you're someone where it doesn't take much to feel that sound kind of like i said happened with me early on with the clarinet if you're like ah like like exactly how you described it a textured kind of woody tone a timbre that's not really on offer from anything else (laughs) if you're playing that yourself that's 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 the best so i you know we want people who are listeners and fans but primarily i'm operating from this back behind this side of the the flute and understanding that that's um, when all that all that uh, verbiage there lands. That's when it makes sense. I mean, I hope people listening understand that that's going on. But it would be a little bit like not learning meditation with someone, but just sit going to uh, an event where you watch someone else meditate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does yeah. that help you or not? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like what you're describing as a musician, I, I guess, is this the um, 
this sort of sacred spiritual aspect of of tone creation of being we we did an episode um with Michael Harrison who's a, a Hazrat Inyat Khan scholar and he talked a lot about this sacred sound practice and how these uh breath and energy of of sound creation um uh, but also as a listener the, the the alchemic process of listening to music how that can be a deeply and profoundly spiritual practice yeah i think that could definitely be going on um alchemy is a great um thing just like dragons and that that they appear really strongly in the east and in the west mm -hmm. so either there's a deeper common root or it's something that was just going to be um part of people's wisdom teachings and sort of experiments but the rosicrucian um steps of alchemy are the ones that i am familiar with and return to a lot and so that's what i was referring to there saying tension alchemy because um even if you were playing you know a single drum like a taiko drum or a drum set or an upright bass or a trombone any any instrument you're engaging with in the depths of it where you go essentially from being beginner to intermediate to advanced um the ability to dissolve and then consolidate tension only where it's needed only where it's going to essentially convert into sound and tone and vibration and of course there is a vertical component there there's a sacred aspect like you were just saying but this physical ability part and music itself is very horizontal and so that's a lot of what we're um doing on shakuhachi is sort of subverting the horizontality because our zen pieces are pulse free um, but as soon as you have rhythm and pulse you're horizontal and going through the passage of time but the tone production part is vertical and so bringing those together um requires these kinds of uh what i call their tension alchemy i i often use um bruce lee as an example because you can find photos of him for instance where if you were to cover from the neck down it looks like it it looks like he's having like his um senior high school photo taken or something <laughs> and then if you if from the neck down he's like completely uh flexed and yeah. like you know <laughs> ripped and you're just like wow so it was that picture that i was like okay that's that's one deeper background way to describe his mastery is the absolute ability to consolidate and dissolve tension only where it's needed and not where it's not needed. This is where a lot of repetitive stress stuff comes from, from musicians. It's not, mm -hmm. they're playing too much. It's there, there, there's too much tension that, that isn't needed. It's really hard to, dissolve again and is tension also connected to uh, musical tension so building a tension in an improvisation or a composition and then resolving that tension through consonants or uh, harmony exactly yeah no that would be the um another way that vert the vertical and horizontal dimensions are working together is a harmonic tension resolve and then how that plays out in the the rhythm part the time based aspect yeah exactly
And so also, could you go, going back, um, could you describe a bit the Rosicrucian alchemy, um, how that is woven into what you do? Well, I don't pay attention to it a lot, frankly. I mean, I want to mm. I want to start introducing it more in the midst of some of the other things that I commonly teach, either whether in master classes or in the, sort of the deeper the deeper practice with my regular students. But um, I believe that these seven steps could be mapped onto almost anything, mm-hmm. like like your your relationship to your you know a friend or your your significant other your relationship to your dog um your your relationship to um you know current events or changing your diet um and then certainly these other things like we're talking about skill based um holistic practices even if it's just zazen everything from zazen to you know surfing and rock climbing and kayaking i'm often relating uh, what we're doing with Shakuhachi more to either the meditative uh, arts or the meditative side of martial arts like Tai Chi and Qigong or to uh, like outdoor sports, which a lot of my students have come from that world. And so I've developed this kind of theory that people who've done, you know, rock climbing and surfing, kayaking, et cetera, uh, get it. They understand what we're up to with Shakuhachi sooner than a lot of musicians. Um, and then on the other side, same with martial arts or yoga, um, especially instructors or people who've really been doing um, doing it for a long time. If they can understand that what we're doing is a little more like that, then they kind of enter in at a higher level. But um, the and and also you can map it onto society. Like a lot of what we're dealing with, the struggles are being mid process. Um, you know, so somebody that uh, I have a hard time um, not getting excited about anything they say, to put it that way, is uh, Charles Eisenstein. And of course, one of his models is that we're, we need to move out of the story of separation mm-hmm. and the story of interbeing is what a lot of us are intuiting is, is, is where we need to be or move into and that that actually so happens to i didn't hear that until maybe just a couple you know two years ago or so but that happened to correspond with my assessment that we're just we're just at the third step of this rosicrucian alchemy process which is the separatio Mm -hmm. so the first two steps are a little um, obscure the first one is um calcination which is kind of a firing uh, of everything and a kind of a, a heating up. And then after that, you have dissolution. So you have a lot of the pieces uh, falling away in the dissolution. So those two can be a little tricky to say, okay, well, how do we, how do I think of calcination? One way to think of calcination, I guess, is just awareness. You know, there's a fire to awareness. There's an illumination or a light quality. So something is no longer completely hidden if you can bring awareness to it. And then things kind of start to dissolve, which lead right into um, some parts of it and some parts remain, which lead right into the separatio. Sometimes I switch into the Latin because it's fun. So the separatio would be taking different pieces of different types away from each other. Um, But of course, right after that is conjunctio. Then you put them back together. (laughs) Okay, and so why have you done that? It seems like you're just undoing your work. It's just it's all about awareness, we could say, in a way. There's a seeing and a kind of a sub-level understanding about going through that process. I mean, for all you know, for all I know, you could see kids doing this all the time, playing with um, Legos or anything else that's physical in this sort of toddler phase of things where their mind is understanding parts and and the whole what's the, how, how are these related these bits and pieces and then how they come together then the fifth step is where the magic happens that's fermentation and it's it's literally you know magic so that's why there's some things that might not seem like they're going to save the world but i'm a little excited that they're going on like you know small craft brew kind of operations and this kind of thing that are old practices that have, have come back a little bit in, in recent days and just anything that's kind of small and really um, trying to put 
value and qualitative awareness on the process of of production. So fermentation is kind of the the, the black box there where mm-hmm. we can't we can't get too analytical about what goes on. It's the magic. And then after that, you have um, uh, distillation, and so distillation is something that really um, seems to be running strong in a lot of, uh, especially in the Japanese arts or the Do, which are just the way, right? Like Judo and Aikido. The Do is the same uh, character as Dao, as the path or the way. And so Shakuhachi is really Shakuhachi Do. And then there's, um, you know, like the archery and the flower arranging. There's a lot of these Zen um, Japanese arts so-called traditional arts and some go back further than others and some have evolved more than others, but you can see this distillation quality um, recurring more than in other cultural arts that sometimes are, are really celebrating complexity right. or ornateness or yeah. things like that. Um, and, and so you can, you can get that right away with reading, you know, sort of more Indian uh, or, or even like Thai, like Buddhist sutras versus like some of our Zen, um, you know, sermons or koans or whatever, where it's like, it's not so much about the, the 15,000 Buddhas with the 100 million lotuses and then opening into the, you know, there's this kind of ornate complexity mm-hmm. celebration that has a certain inspiring quality to it. And then in Zen, we have a lot of the opposite of that. Um, so distillation is... Uh, Shakuhachi like really embodies that. It's a very distilled for a, an instrument. And then the seventh final step is coagulation. And co- that's also a, a word that we don't use in the way that's got this high mode, like, a, like it's kind of used here. Mm-hmm. Um, like a coagulant is just something you're going to think, okay, I don't know what that, so it might not be that inspiring of a term compared to fermentation, distillation or more familiar as something magical, but it just means now it's a new unified thing. So as like a composer, performer, and uh, producer, you know, recording my own stuff, that's that's that piece of it. And so most musicians, uh, composers, ensemble players, recording artists understand these steps, whether they realize it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for outlining that for us. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> And it's interesting too to use this word alchemy um, because of I was saying before we started recording I live near this community and it's based around the alchemy school of healing arts which is a based on breath work and it's using breath work as a tool for for transformation. So I'm wondering if if the connection there with the breath with the shakuhachi but also with singing as, as you mentioned earlier if there's something in there um, in that alchemy that 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 self change and the creation, you know, I love this, what you're talking about, the, the sort of feedback loop of blowing mm-hmm. into the shakuhachi and getting this energy back into you. It's this circular, um, very almost ecological, um, you know, circle of life thing of the, the, the living bamboo giving you energy back that you're putting into it. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And so breath is, a, is itself a pretty distilled, uh, representation, actual representation, or an analogy, you know, to a lot of these other processes. Mm-hmm. And this is why, whether it's in the, the, the sort of the Taoist Eastern um, history, some of it that gets pretty, pretty bizarre, or also in Western esotericism and, and, and the occult, where the approach to alchemy can get pretty, you know, pretty bizarre and pretty, um, you know, like I said, really complex or complexity upon complexity seems to be almost the purpose of it. And I've, I spent a lot of time looking into the cult philosophy and the, and the Western esoteric traditions and they offer a lot, but I end up wanting to sort of plant myself back with the Taoists and the early Zen um, Chan Buddhist thinkers um, of, of China because that's where you find things like suchness Mm -hmm. or just this. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so you can get you can get you can get pretty bogged down uh, in some of the especially the histories of the traditions where you've got you've got symbols you've got secret encoding of the secret symbols that then represent a secret inner process that that then you know leads you to the real true teaching at the center of that you know this kind of thing which is like fun for a while but I don't think that we really have time for that anymore these mm-hmm. days. <laughs> um, but alchemy as a term can just be generally say, yeah, just, you know, transformation, mm-hmm. something transformative, but it's also about this, you know, base material becoming more refined and refined material. I don't think that that's a great, uh, uh, reductionism understanding of it anymore either without the circular piece, like you were talking about. It's, it, it, it just becomes another, delusional like hierarchy to say you're coming from something base and then you're refining to the mm-hmm. the philosopher's stone pure you know i mean that, that is that is probably what's happening if you're really doing it but at the same time that's going to get you back back to the fundament and back to the elemental uh pieces in their true essence that you kind of we're, we're, we're there all along. You've mentioned Zen and Buddhism a few times, and I'm wondering to how um, Zen is influenced in, in Shakuhachi. I was doing some research for this conversation. I was reading about um, Suzen, the Zen musical meditation practice. And is that part of your work as well? We could say in a general sense, it definitely is. Um, however, like with a lot of these um, traditional arts and then the, as they become in, in diaspora, as they sort of leave their their land of origin and then get a lot of uh, enthusiasm from people uh, just just globally or, or even from the modern, in this case, Japan, like a, a modern Japanese person is going to have to do a little bit of work to piece together whatever they're going to claim is the traditional practice. Mm-hmm. So there's not one... Uh, story, let's just say. And so Sui Zen, as they refer to it as blowing Zen, that's how it, that's how it translates. And so that's, that's a lot of the appeal when a lot of us first learn about Shakuhachi. It's like, oh, because a lot of us were maybe Zen people already. We understand Zazen. We understand Shikantaza, uh, you know, just sitting. We understand that uh, in the Dogen lineage of Soto Zen, there's a, a, a really, um, of a very focused distillation that's just about sitting. So that takes out a lot of the bowing, a lot of the chanting, um, a lot of the koan uh, practice. Um, they will they will give a nod to things like what the fourth patriarch, I think, instilled, which is a day without work is a day without food. And so this idea of the monastic life where you're practicing Zen just as much when you're planting and harvesting your vegetables and cleaning your dishes and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's all very valuable stuff, but, um, it's not, it's not, um, all inclusive of, of what historical practice could have been. We don't necessarily have accurate documents of, of what were people practicing. So in the sort of ologist circles, and then in the enthusiast uh, circles of Shakuhachi that take up what theologists tell everybody, some of this stuff is highly contentious, let's just say. And by ologists, me, you mean like ethnomusicologists? Precisely. Yeah. Just- yeah. Where I just use that as a general suffix because I appreciate what they might come up with and what they offer, but I really, really resent the idea that they could put that as, as a ceiling of what a practitioner can think is going on. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just a kind of a violation. There wouldn't, there would be no ology. There would be no to study something without the people who actually do the thing. Yeah. And in some cases they're the same people, but um, yeah, they're, 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 they're two, they can be two very conflicting modes of thought because one is analytical and removed and in the head it's not embodied. Like I'm not sure that that in, in a PhD ethnomusicology program, they have a course about how you breathe while you're doing your research. 
but you can be sure they have a whole semester on how do you write a bibliography. <laughs> so these are the people that are getting a stronger voice these days in, in the Shagahachi. And so um, some aspects that might be an actual oral tradition. So in, in, in effect, what is their relationship to the oral tradition versus things you can find documentation for? That's not clear to me. And I'm not sure like that I'm, that I have the time to kind of negotiate that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's one little complexity there is if you get into it and you say, oh, I want to do, you know, blowing Zen meditation with the Shakuhachi. And then 10 years down the line, after you and your teacher have been working on that, somebody comes along on the internet and says that that's all, that's all fake. That, that's all, that's all a lie. Um, th- there were never were monks playing the flute and all this kind of thing. Um, I just see that as kicking people in the shins. They're just taking the magic out of stuff. I mean, it's fine to um, cast some doubt on some of the stories, especially if you're like building a business, like an empire based on selling these stories, but nobody's really, mm-hmm. um, you know, raking in uh, exploitive uh, uh, amounts of cash and power based on these stories. They're, they're lore and they're true to the extent that you're kind of living their essential teachings. And so, the other issue I have is this blowing idea. Just because, I mean, it's getting really nerdy and picky, but we're not really blowing, blowing out a candle. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what a lot of us have to work on for years and years in our tone production. It's really more of an emitting. Mm-hmm. Um, like I say, not a lot of tension, not overdoing it. Everything that comes out of the embouchure opening that gets smaller and smaller and more efficient is converted to tone or texture. So there's a lot of breathiness in our texture. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a kind of a general term, blowing, and in this fife and drum tradition, that's actually part of uh, uh, rural Mississippi blues. Not a lot of people know that because a lot of my music influences come from that music. That's um, the older versions that were recorded in the 20s and 30s, but they were still playing tunes from the 1800s. Mm-hmm. There's a fife and drum uh, tradition there, and uh, Otha Turner is a is a well known figure in that, and he would call it blowing the cane. You know, and just take a piece out of the ground and make a little flute, and whatever he's playing mm-hmm. this. So certain flutes you are actually blowing more if they're if they're smaller and kind of cut through. You know, you're playing with drums or with an ensemble. The big the big wide bore flutes that I specialize in and have the natural bore, um, we don't we tend to not want to use the word blowing too much because it's it's not accurate to what 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 we're really doing. So that's one other little nerdy detail about the term Mm -hmm. itself however it is it it is accurate to say that um to just produce one note on the flute is 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 a deep uh, holistic meditative practice partly because it it takes that horizontal element of when what you tilt into when you're going to do music um even if you're going to play two notes that's got a horizontal component to it. Whereas the one sound um, is all you're ever actually playing. You're, you're, you're only ever actually playing one sound at a time. And so there is the shakuhachi and its subtlety, the way that it deals with vibration and that feedback loop you, you were describing. It's very subtle in terms of the vibration compared to a reed vibrating in your head or your lips vibrating or even the even compared to the vocal cords it's a very kind of soft velvety texture and um so that lends itself really well to sort of just staying with that sound and having this kind of expanded inner um experience that is i mean i'm saying mind body spirit as kind of one phrase but it probably goes way beyond that you know, consciousness, awareness, vibration, manifestation, the invisible, um, all all that stuff is kind of involved. And Mm -hmm. so we're really doing that for sure. But I can't say that we have like a, a, um, a standardized method that gets people into that. Um, which is kind of okay because I like to kind of design it for myself. I encourage my students to design it for themselves. You know, you use your shugyo, your morning, your morning routine. You know, I've done the same morning routine for probably 12 years. It involves uh, tea and qigong and stretches and long tones um, on the flutes. And that's a different 
modality to connect with the flute that's separate from like your practice session or working on pieces you're working on. Or even if you were going to present a meditation for people, that would be a, in a slightly different modality. So it's a real uh, fertile ground that Shakuhachi has. Like all we need is that little bit of seeds, you know, oh yeah, there's a history of this with Zen. Boom. That's mm-hmm. like enough. <laughs> and, and you can tell that it makes sense, you know, to, to, to do it. It lends itself towards that. Sure, you could do it with any instrument. You could do it, you know, painting a house or, or you know, doing carpentry. But this really is um, designed in a way to, to, to feed back into that um, personal, inner, expanded quality. Yeah. yeah. And there's probably something, well, there's definitely something to the lineage too, you know, the sort of association of the shakuhachi with, with Zen is maybe similar to, you know, someone hearing a, a harmonium to do a kirtan, you know, there's something sort of magical about this having gone on for hundreds or even thousands of years that this is the, this is the method that we, that we've inherited from the generations of how to, Mm -hmm. how to explore these places. Cool. Well, this has been a really beautiful conversation. I learned a lot uh, about shakuhachi (laughs) and Zen and all the connections in and alchemy. So uh, I want to thank you so much for being on the Sounds of Sand, reconnecting with science and non-duality again after all these years. Um, and you have any uh, projects or anything coming up that we can let people know about for this summer? Well, let's see. Um, there will be probably a new ensemble recording. In 2019, I had uh, made a new kind of evolution in what I was doing by writing for uh, um for Taimu Shakuhachi. Taimu is the sort of a brand name of the wide bore, lower pitched flutes that uh, Ken Lacoste in San Francisco would make a Mujitsu Shakuhachi, the shirt I'm wearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and those have a particular timbre that that really bridges back from what you might think of as Shakuhachi and that timbre of the bass clarinet, like we were talking about, a little bit fuller. And it wasn't in the my plan, but eventually I did start writing for a quartet of those voices. But then it was like 2019. So we only had a couple concerts before everything kind of met with the dissolution, we could say of, Mm -hmm. of 2020, but I did carry on and continue writing, um, for four bass shakuhachi essentially, and put an album out of a multi-movement piece called wood prophecy. Some of that might be what, what we play in in the midst of this, um, episode, but there's going to be another, multi-movement piece uh coming out maybe in june again this year that's called bigfoot revelation and it's about bigfoot in a way cool (laughs) um for that same instrumentation so that's that's just going to come out um probably digitally and other than that i'm just uh trying to get back to playing live shows mostly at churches that sound good and whoever wants me to come and uh give people a little bit of the old breathing bamboo i'm <laughs> i'm uh i'm uh open to open to proposals um yeah that's about it cool nice yeah so as you mentioned we're gonna end the episode with a, a, a longer piece of your music we've been hearing little bits and pieces of it throughout so thanks for sharing your music with us today and thanks for all that you do and your teaching and sharing the shakuhachi with the world Thanks for taking an interest in it. I really appreciate it. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of sand content, available exclusively to sand members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. And share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.